right, welcome to New Endings Radio. My name is Darren. I'm your host today, and we have our co-host Stacy with us. Hello. Stacy. we have uh, Frankie from California on today. Yes, we do. He grew up in East L.A. and was actually an East L.A. gang member. But uh, the purpose of this show is to show folks that we're all the same. Right. So you hear these stories, and you may think, well, I'm not as bad as this person or that person. Right. The point is that uh, you have issues. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if you're a gang member or you're an executive of of a company or you're a pastor or deacon of your church. Or a housewife. That's right. Everybody may be struggling with some sort of a substance use disorder, and it doesn't matter who you are, where you're at in society, it's the same struggle. That is correct. And you're just inflicting pain on yourself and everyone around you. Right, right. And everyone's bottom is different. Yep. Um, We talked to Eric a few weeks ago. He was living in a tent under a bridge. Yes. But my bottom was not like that. I had a regular job. I, my wife had not left me. I had not lost my house. And that's where a lot of you folks are, is that you're living a daily life, but you're not doing the right thing. Right. And unless you address these issues and say, okay, look, I have to do something, Mm -hmm. then you're going to continue on. And, you know, just because that you're not homeless doesn't mean that you have serious problems. Right. Or you're not affecting everyone around you. Exactly. That's the, that's the worst part is there's a lot of collateral damage that goes on with this. Now, your issue may not necessarily be alcohol or drugs. Right. Uh, there's all kinds of people we talk to. A, a lot of, uh, you know, sexual childhood abuse that affects you for a long time. There's a lot of uh, women we talk to that are in abusive relationships. Uh-huh. Can't get out. Right. Uh, until you decide to make a change, then nothing will change. Right. And, nothing changes and, if uh, yeah, nothing changes. And there I, you go. And like I said, I'm no Dr. Phil. No, you are not. But I know knew at one point that I had to do something different. Yes. In any case, let's get to Frank. Frankie on here and hear what Frankie has to say. All right. Welcome to the show, Frankie. Hey, Frankie. Hey, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you for coming on, Frankie. Now, um, you've heard this, uh, our show before, right? Oh, yeah. So you know kind of how it works. You know, what I kind of like to ask is uh, a lot of people have that moment in their life where they flip and just go, you know, they decide they have to go a different direction. Sometimes it's some sort of trauma or sometimes they just decide they're just tired and and just need to move on. Mm -hmm. So did you have any uh, moment in your life that uh, you just decided, look, I just got to I got to do something different? Yes. As a matter of fact, in October of 2012, I was driving home drunk uh, in the carpool lane with no cars. After four DUIs, now learning my lesson, losing one marriage and about to lose the second and about to lose my job, I have felt a voice or a Holy Spirit tug at me and said, oh, this is it. And I, I couldn't do this no more. And I was heading for a fifth DUI and, and something had to change. Right. And I felt that in my heart. So did you make it home okay that night? Yes. Okay. So it wasn't. Although I, I don't remember much of it. <clears throat> right. But it wasn't a police thing or anything like that. You just decided, hey, I can't do this no. anymore. I'm done, yeah, right? That, that okay. didn't help me. After four DUIs, I did not learn my lesson. I got right, you. Well, right. We're going to have to hear something about these four DUIs. What, let's find out uh, kind of what led up to that. We don't know a whole lot about you, so why don't we go back and kind of figure out what happened. Where did you grow up? In California, you said? Okay. Yes. I was raised in Mexico until the age of eight, and then we moved to Los Angeles okay. uh, from eight to the age of 17. So I grew up in, in East L.A. In East L.A. Okay. I heard that's a pretty rough area, I guess. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, I was in the in the prime of of gang violence and really yeah. Were you were you in a gang? Yes, I joined at the age of twelve. Oh, wow, okay. what happened at twelve? Left, yeah, my my mom left my my dad, who was a a raging alcoholic and very uh, physically abusive to oh. my mom and to us. He broke my oh. leg at the age of eight from kicking me so hard. Oh, and so she decided that's it. She left him while he was at work, and by then it was go time for me. Mm. I had no more fear of anybody, and I hit the streets and joined the gang and got addicted to drugs and became an alcoholic. Okay, so how do how exactly do you join a gang? I mean, do you just people recruit you, or how does that happen? Yeah, well, they they were in my neighborhood, so you usually join the gang that's in your own neighborhood, mm-hmm. and so you start by hanging out with them, and once they figure out that you're a, a good candidate. Then uh, a bunch of guys jump you in by beating you up, basically. Wow. Mm-hmm. Just like you hear on the movies, but now we're hearing it from Frankie. About that. All right. So I guess high school must not have gone so good then, huh? Oh, no. Like I said, uh, by then I, I was full of hate and resentment. Yeah. Because I blame God for all the bad stuff that's happened to me up to this point. And unfortunately, when you're in the gang life, the crazier you are, the more you are respected. Mm-hmm. And so in school, all I did was represent the gang. Mm, and at the age of 12, I had to be crazier than normal people. And so by at the time I hit high school, my freshman year, 
I got kicked out after two weeks. Wow. And then in total, I got kicked out of uh, six different high schools. Why did you keep two continuation schools? Why did you keep getting kicked out? What were you doing? Fighting. I was a target and I targeted people. Oh, uh, okay. And so uh, my sophomore year was because I threatened the teacher's life. Okay. Why did you do that? And then my junior year was because of drug dealing. Okay. And well, then that's when the LA Unified School District said, that's it. We're done with you. Well, mm. Go back a second. Give me the option to go to Utah. Okay, well, hang on one second. Go back. Why did you threaten a teacher? I threatened the teacher because they I felt disrespected by that teacher. Okay, she was mimicking me and mocking my mm. my neighborhood. Oh, okay, see. okay. Well, if you're an angry child, I guess that would probably right. put you over the put yeah. you over the yeah. edge. Yeah. yeah. All right, so you you got kicked out of six different schools, high schools, and then they sent you to Utah. What what's that all about? Why would they send you to Utah? Well, they, they had a a program out there called Job Corps, so I, I went to Clearfield Job Corps where I could continue my education and learn a trade. Okay, so police there in L.A. or whatever said you had to go. No, okay. right. it was either that or or get lost in the in the streets. They had no no other option. Right, right. So you get to uh, Utah. So uh, what happened there? What, what went on when you got to Utah? Did things change? Did well, you, were you as angry? Utah, or? It was in, yes, it was in 1997. L.A. gangs were getting famous. And yeah. so when I got to uh, Utah, they had people from Wyoming, Montana, and some states, a lot of states that had no gangs. And so I was pretty much uh, very respected and I had a lot of power and I, just, I was addicted to power. Well, how you like wow. you're a celebrity. So, yeah, you're yeah, a gang yeah. celebrity. You know, yeah. like without sounding egotistical or anything. Yeah, well, right, right. That's, that's just the, the way it was. That's yeah. the fact, yeah. And I'm yeah. guessing you're still doing drugs and drinking and all that. Oh yeah. I was sneaking uh bottles of Everclear that oh. were taping my inner thighs and I sent two people to the hospital for alcohol poisoning that tried to keep up with me. Because well, by the age of seventeen I already had Five years experience of drinking. Right. I mean, I started with 40s of old English and King Cobra at the age of 12. Right. Wow. Well, you were primed then, and if you're, yep. if you're, uh, if you're feeding people ever clear, then bad things are going to happen. So. <laughs> right. All right. Well, let's uh, let's take a short break here, Frankie, and uh, when we come back, we're going to have to hear a little bit more about what happened there in uh, Utah. So we'll be right back with uh, Frankie from California. Hi, this is your host, Darren. We hear stories every week from average people with common issues. You may be listening and thinking that your life isn't as bad as those people. Well, let me bring you back to reality. If you are unhappy with your current position in your marriage, or you have convinced yourself that your drinking is not an addiction because you don't drink as much as those other people you know, then it's bad, and you need rockyourfamily.org. Rockyourfamily.org will help individuals, couples, and families dealing with addiction, infidelity, or just growing apart through counseling, intensive counseling, IOP recovery, both online or in person, and even retreats to just find yourself again. Think about your life right now. If you are living every day in a place you are not happy with, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this to myself? It only takes a couple of clicks to see how rockyourfamily.org can help you in your marriage, in your addiction, or in your family. Go to rockyourfamily.org and do something different. That makes a lot more sense than just hoping things will get better on their own. That's rockyourfamily.org. Okay, welcome back to New Endings Radio. We're talking to Frankie from California. Yeah. And we've heard uh, a lot Quite a of, story. Yeah, a lot about the uh, East LA gangs. Right. And what we've realized is that what we see on TV is fairly accurate. Right, it or it like. was back then. Yeah, back right? then, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So, in any case, you get kicked out of six different high schools in L.A. Mm-hmm. They said, okay, here's your choice. You can be on the streets, live on the streets, or, be homeless. Or yeah. go to Utah to the Job Corps and right. do something like that. So, you went up to Job Corps, but it kind of continued on, Frankie, from what you're telling us. And you were still fighting. You're kind of a celebrity up there and because of your gang affiliations. And so, how'd that work out? Did you graduate their program or what? I did fairly well in the beginning. I completed my GED, which gave me credits towards my high school diploma. Then I finished uh, a trade called general merchandising, which was easy because I just had to do stuff on computers. And so I graduated high school uh, mm. by a miracle, only by the grace of God, because I was still surprised that I graduated. Right. And after that, I started uh, doing well. I got some a sense of I can do things. You know, positive thing. Mm. Okay. And so I started uh, applying myself, even though I was doing all the extracurricular activities, I was putting effort into the trade. 
and a week before I graduated, I got kicked out for fighting. Fighting uh, again? A, a resident. Because things were going graduate, good, and you still went back. Habits. Why are you fighting everybody, so, Frankie? Why are you fighting everybody? I had a lot of hate. I was full of resentment. I didn't yeah. know how to process emotions, and you know, I was a uh, fight or flight in it, so it was always fight. I was full of fear. Hmm. Full of fear, and it acted out in anger. Yeah. Right, a right. A lot of anger and a lot of rage. So you're on a good track, and then they kick you out of there. What did you stay there and do something, or no? Uh, the rules are they have to fly you back to where you came from. So uh, they flew oh, me boy. back to Los Angeles with my mom. Uh oh. And I wanted to get out of there as quick as possible. And so I got a job, and then I found out my job was in Utah in Salt Lake City, where I had met a girl. Which she didn't know the real me because I had limited contact with her because I was in Jonquil and then only let you out a limited amount of time. Ah, okay. And so when I moved back in with her, then she got to know the real me. Okay. And so let's stop one second now. Okay. So just to clarify this, you, you you went to Utah and while you're up there, before you got kicked out, you met a girl. Right. But she didn't know the, his whole right, story because, because of the limited access. Yeah. Right, exactly. Okay, so okay. then you go back to California. Because they have to ship him back to where right. he came from. And you lived with your mom for a little while. How'd that go? Uh, not good. Uh, we okay. barely spoke. Uh, like I said, I had a lot of uh, resentment towards her. Mm-hmm. And I am unfair- unfairly blamed her uh, for everything that happened to me as a kid. Yeah. Okay. And and not, not realizing that she was caught in the crossfire as well. Right. When you're in your addiction and alcoholism, you, you can't differentiate the truth from the false. And mm-hmm. so I was just a victim of life. And I blamed right. everybody for it. Right. Right. Well, that's one one thing about uh, addicts is that uh, everything's everybody else's fault, and mm-hmm. they don't do yeah. anything wrong. You know. Right. So, right. And that's one of the problems with it. Mm-hmm. All right. So you got a job down in, in L.A., and then they had a another office up in Salt Lake. Is that it? Is that how you? Yeah. So you transferred. Correct. Okay, right. I got you. So you transfer back to Utah, and you get with the with your girlfriend. Okay. I think I'm following this now. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. So now you're back back with your girlfriend, and then she figures out that uh, you do a lot of drinking, evidently. And drugging. Yeah. And drugging. Okay. Yeah. So uh, how'd you get along with her family? Um, her her dad was kind of skeptical towards me, but his, his, she, he had all girls, and they pretty much called the shots. And so as long as she was seemingly happy, it was okay. Okay. Mm. But the violence or the abuse hadn't started yet. Uh, abuse you so you were abusing your your wife also then yeah after after okay yeah but he hasn't got married yet you just jumped to he had a girlfriend yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah. And, and what she for, what she forgot to tell me was that she cheated on me and got pregnant ah <laughs> okay wait. so she cheated on you when you were in california yes so she's pregnant yes okay correct all right so she's pregnant with someone else's child and uh mm-hmm. and you stayed together yeah, I didn't know she was pregnant. I was so uh, caught up in my alcoholism and drug addiction okay. that she worked at Burger King, so I thought she was just putting a little too much cheese on her Whoppers. Oh, no. <laughs> so, oh, like, you didn't go there, Frankie. That's, what, that's one way to say it, I guess. A, <laughs> all right. well, so when she go. was seven months, I, I, I left her because I just didn't understand why she was crying so much. Uh, and nice. after I left her, about a month later, she had the baby, and I found out she had the baby, and then I was like, whoa, what a she cheated. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Okay, so did you get back together with her then? or? Yeah, well, in, in my mind, I was going to give her a piece of my mind because I had come to Utah for her. So I right. go victim mode. But when I get there, I see, I see her and the baby was in the car seat. Her, her name's Melina. I thought to myself, this is the greatest lie I've told my, myself through, through all my alcoholism was. That I didn't want that little girl to grow up. Without love and without the, without mm. a daddy. Oh, that's good. And so her real father was a meth addict, so he wasn't around. Oh. And so what I told her is, I'll take you back if then I had conditions. If you move back with me and you have no contact with the real father, if he ever tries to get a hold of her, which he did, and I didn't allow him to see his daughter because I was just like my dad. And right. he couldn't process uh, the fact that another man can be involved in parenting. So she agreed to that? Yeah, she agreed. And okay. And you got married? Yes, we got married and she had my son a couple years later. Okay. So, All right. So you have a daughter and a son now and uh, you're still married. You said it got abusive. What what kind of triggered that 
abuse? What what made yeah, you start so doing that? Yeah, so when she moved in with me, by then I was very resentful because I had found out that she cheated on me. Right, right. And don't you know I'm a victim? So mm-hmm. now it's time to to make her pay. Yeah. And the real the real reason came why I moved her in with me. I moved her in with me because it was 35 miles away from the real from her parents' house. Yeah. Uh, she didn't drive, and so I pretty much isolated her. her. At, at base. Yeah. Yeah. You can't go to your parents. They can't come here. And oh. I became uh, very vicious with my tongue and started mm. degrading her for what she did and never forgave her. Right. And then it became uh, physically abusive because mm. to me, when you grow up in chaos, all you know is chaos. And yeah. I became exactly what, what I hated. Right. Which was my dad. Mm-hmm. Right. So now you're living just like your dad uh, had, had done to you. And we're kind of hearing Correct. it from the the horse's mouth because we usually right. hear it from the ladies that are telling them this. So here's the, right. the other right. side of this, mm-hmm. a- acknowledging the fact that he was abusive verbally, oh, yeah. right. controlling. Physically, isolating. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. it happens to, to a lot of ladies out there. So. Right, right. Well, um, we're going we're gonna to take a little bit of a break here. Uh, Frankie, when we come back, we're going to have to hear what the next uh, stage here was. Um, I'm assuming we're going in the right direction. We usually point. go okay. in the right direction so, on New Index we're, we're Radio. Have to find out, but, <laughs> and we'll be uh, right back with Frankie from California. Hi, this is Darren, your host for New Endings Radio. Here on New Endings Radio, we talk about all of life's hurts, habits, and hangups. Every week, we talk to real people with real struggles. We hear about what life experiences led them to reaching the breaking point and finally reaching out for help. We hear how they overcame denial and how Celebrate Recovery and their true higher power, Jesus Christ, helped them get their life back. Celebrate Recovery is not all about alcohol and drugs. There are many things in life that keep us held down. All of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups keep us from being the people we were meant to be. Celebrate Recovery helps us break those chains that keep us down and deal with our denial. For those of you on the fence that know you have an issue but think you're the only one, listen to how these people have the same feelings you do. Then get yourself over the fear to change. We can all change, but no one can make you change. You have to do it for yourself. No one else can do it for you. Okay, welcome back to New Endings Radio. We have uh, Frankie from California with us. Yes, we do. Just definitively, it was very abusive to his wife. Right, kids. Yeah, exactly, and isolating and very controlling. Yes. But uh, it lasted for five years. What happened at the end of that five years, Frankie? Well, at five years, she had enough. Yeah. And she was too scared of my reaction if she ever thought of leaving me, so she left me just like my mom left my dad while I was at work. Mm. I came home to nothing. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Well, that is just like your dad, and that's the exact same story. Wow, that's amazing, we, isn't it? It's yep. that uh, generational yeah, addiction yeah. and, you know, it's, it's that we else. talk about. Yeah, exactly. That's right. All right. Well, then uh, you're by yourself then at that point. What did you do then? What happened? Well, once I was by myself, just like when I was at 12 and I had no more dad, that's how I felt. No more responsibilities. And so within three years, I had three DUIs. Oh, boy. Wow. Okay. So you were on a roll then. Oh, yeah, I was deep into drugs, methamphetamines, cocaine, crack. Wow. You were still weed every day. And you're still holding down a job? Yes. I needed to pay for it. I was at least that smart. Right, okay. right. Uh, well, you, okay, so you're up there and you got your three DUIs up there in Utah. You're by yourself. How'd you end up in California? Well, I did jail time on all three DUIs, including the fines. And on my last, uh, my third DUI, I was in jail for nine months. Oh. And I was able to get sober. Then in jail, realized, okay. Uh, Utah was the problem. Yeah, Utah's the problem, man, so I need to go back home. Okay, so you left the scene of the crime thinking that was the problem, but, but like we what? hear all the time, <laughs> yeah. it's not the location, no, it's the person. it's the person, it's the addiction. Right. Okay, so you went back to L.A. and uh, continued on, I guess, right? Yes, that took me with me. Yes. And I got a fourth DUI wrecking my mom's car a month later. Oh. Oh, okay, so this must be the... Just before the uh, time you're driving home, then I guess, right? And made that monumental decision. About a year, a year and a half before that. So you got your fourth DUI, and then you kept going for another year, and then you're driving home, and you decide, okay, well, I just can't do this anymore. Yeah, that was about two months after I got charged with a domestic violence charge because I was still doing what I was doing, yeah, Uh, which was being very abusive. I 
I sought out women that were codependent, and so you know the rest. All right. Okay. Well, um, so on this night you're driving home, you say, I got to do something different. W- what did you do different? So the next day I started attending Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, oh okay. good. Uh, in the mornings before work and then at lunchtime. And then when I got home at 530 and then at 8 o'clock. Wow. Well, didn't, days. didn't they make you go to AA when you're uh, getting all those DUIs up in Utah? Yes, but oh, okay. I saw every single difference rather than any kind of similarity. All right, well, see, I, uh, I did a lot of AA meetings myself, and all the ones that they forced me to go to did no good for me. <laughs> right. Because I didn't want right. to be there. Right, right. You know, right. It, it was until I made a decision that I have to change and do something different, everything mm-hmm. was still everybody else's fault, and they were forcing me to do this, yes. and I just hated it. Yes. And, and, you know, so when I finally went on my own, I decided I got to do this. Everything was different. So you saw things and like I did in a total different light, right? Yes. All right. So you're going to all these AA meetings. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you celebrate recovery on Fridays and Sundays. Oh, nice. Okay. Okay. So you're going to celebrate recovery and AA. Correct. Boy, you were on a mission. Yeah. I'd say so. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I I truly believe that I needed a rehab. And so I kept myself really busy. Nice. Okay. Very good. All right, so um, in all that time, did you meet another lady? Yeah, I was living with uh, another woman that I married in Hawthorne, California. How, how did that go? Well, that's why I went back to AA in 2012 because I got charged with a domestic violence. That's where that oh, domestic violence. Okay, okay, okay gotcha. I gotcha. All right, so th- now you're by yourself again, but you're going you're going to all the meetings, so I guess you're on the right track. You didn't go yeah. hog wild well, like I'm, you did I'm before. I'm still with the wife. She, still, she forgave me. Oh, okay. Oh, really? oh, okay. okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. So how did you get involved in Celebrate Recovery? Uh, there was a flyer at church at Florence Avenue Foursquare Church. And so I figured, oh, I'm going to check it out. Okay. And I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. What did you like about it? I love the, the worship that gets you uh, kind of mushy, mushy and ready for, for the lesson. Uh-huh. And then, <laughs> you know, it invites uh, the Holy Spirit in and then yes. you have a lesson that's that references the Bible, which is the truth, mm-hmm. and you can't argue it. And just, it's a lot more uh, for me. It was a lot more impactful. Yes, as far as for everything that I deal with, because I'm more than just an alcoholic. Right. Right. Well, you, you know, you you mentioned the Holy Spirit and Jesus and that type of thing, but you're from your story, your whole life, it didn't sound like God was in your life before that. What what changed? Did you accept Christ at some point during this, or? Yes, in my okay. last term in jail. There was uh, a couple from Solid City Foursquare Church, and they came to minister. And oh, there you go. And they, they said the line that Jesus will forgive you no yes. matter how bad your sins have been. Mm-hmm. And so I accepted them uh, that day in my life, but I had no discipline to follow him. Right, the rest right. Of the day. That's another story we hear a lot. Is yeah. that you know you you know what you need to do, but then you can't. You can't, you you're know, not can't there. Keep the relationship right, right, up. Right. And you just you to go. Okay, well, good. So celebrate recovery helped you get that back. Yes, okay. I got baptized in 2011. Great. Well, did you do any step studies while you were at uh, Celebrate Recovery? Yes, uh, I started doing the one at Florence Avenue Foursquare, but then I moved with my wife, and that's when uh, I stopped doing that one. But then I opened the uh, Celebrate Recovery in 2015, and I've been doing step studies ever since. Nice. So what did you learn about yourself during your step studies? I was not a victim, but I had a part to play in almost every situation that I blamed other people for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that uh, most importantly, Jesus forgave me and yeah. given me another opportunity to live a life beyond my wildest dreams mm-hmm. because I don't deserve it. And that's God's mercy. And so who am I to hold all these resentments towards everybody else? And so it allowed me to forgive everybody and to be white as snow and to continue mm-hmm. that way by working on myself every single day and on my character and getting to know God even more by seeking him. Oh, that's awesome. Right. So you had some sort of structure now and you knew what you needed to do and you stuck to it. Oh yeah. It's all about the relationship you have with, yes. with God. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not just accepting him. You need to develop a relationship with mm-hmm. him and, and depend on him to, to help you through everything. That's what yes. celebrate recovery is all about. Yep. That's right. All right. So you, you're married now, I guess. Yes. I met my wife and, 2018. Okay. After a year of no dating and no talking to women because I had a problem with lust and codependency. Uh, Oh, okay. okay. So you cut yourself off from that and healed from all that too. That's awesome. Yes. So you met, did you meet her at a recovery place or didn't? I met her in Alcoholics Anonymous. Really? How about that? She 
she was at Alano Club and she worked in the bag making sandwiches. And so I would go on Sundays after church and just talk to her. Nice. How about that? <laughs> so you've been married for how long now? We've been married going on two years two ah. in April, Great. April 13th. Okay. All right. And you're still going to celebrate recoveries? Yes. Well, now we go to celebrate recovery. We moved after we got married on April 13th. We moved to Humboldt County, California, okay. where my mom lives. Okay. And uh, only God orchestrating his divine intervention because uh, we lived out here a year and then we just moved and we just happened to move in a unit right under my mom. Uh -huh. She was having a lot of trouble with her neighbors. And so now she's happy. I get to do a living amends with her. Oh, uh, nice. Whatever she needs. And it's just, as so, like I said, beyond my wildest Yeah, dreams. God is good. So she was in East L.A. Yeah. and ended up where you're at. Correct. Mm -hmm. she, was, wow. she was in Humboldt County for six years before I came up here. How about wow. that? Wow. <laughs> it's a God thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, it's great. I'm, uh, you know, Frankie, I'm glad you're doing good. You know, it, uh, the story, you know, there's a lot of people that are going to relate to that. You yes. know, the anger issue. We don't hear a whole lot about anger. You had a, some severe anger issues. Mm hmm Especially yes. trying to fight everybody and everybody else. There's a lot of people out there that need to hear that and right. know that there's hope. And uh, you just have to do something. Right. You, you can't right. just continue right. in the same path and keep doing the same thing over and over or nothing's going to change. You can go all the counselors you want. You can go all the AA meetings you want. But until you're ready to change and do something different, then nothing's going to change. Give it to God. Right. That's right. So. Yep. All right, Frankie. Well, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. All it right. All, all right. right. Thank and you, Frankie. And make sure you tell everybody about Celebrate Recovery. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. I always do. That's right. <laughs> Broken chains, that's what we do. Woohoo! So there you go. Broken, Broken chains. <laughs> all, right, all right. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Frankie. Thanks, Frankie. Okay, thank you, guys. And for all the rest of you folks, we'll see you next week here on New Endings Radio. And in the meantime, if uh, you are in a situation you don't like, you need to do something. If you sit there and just complain and gripe and blame everybody else, uh, you're not going to get any better. You have to remember it's your responsibility and you need to stop or do something different for yourself. So hopefully you will leave your warning from all these people and do something for yourself. We'll see you next week on New Endings Radio. We like to end each week with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next.